Good evening, everyone. With the time being 6 p.m. on Tuesday, March 22nd, 2022, I'll call this meeting of the Webster School Committee to order and ask that we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, the first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from the March 8th, 2022 meeting. I'll entertain a motion to approve them as presented. So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Lori, would you pull the committee, please? Yes. 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 The next item on the agenda is uh, the minutes from the March 14th, 22 multi board meeting. I'll entertain a motion to approve them or any discussion. So moved. Second. It's a motion and a second. Lori, would you pull the committee, please? Yes. 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 Motion passes. And the next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. Good evening, Dr. Gogan. Hello, everyone. Nice to see everyone. And it's nice to see the nice weather happening. Spring is here. Um, I will start with my personnel update tonight. I would like to let you know that Gloria Rivera is a new hire for the adult education. She's a part-time teacher. Amanda Gomes has been hired as an ABA, as a paraprofessional um, at Park Ave. We have received the resignation of a Matthew Kozlowski, grade 7 ELA teacher, the resignation of Amy Scott, the adult ed lead educator and employment advisor, and Brandon Wade, a Bartlett High School paraprofessional. I'd like to give um, the school committee an update on sports, and I have asked um, Athletic Director Tony Peranto to join me tonight. Uh, before Mr. Peranto speaks, I do want to let you know that um, we did, you and I, received a letter from a student with concerns about um, soccer for next year. That letter is in your school committee packet. Um, I have had a, a meeting with that student and another student and three parents with Mr. Peranto to discuss their concerns. Um, I would like you to know that we are in the process of uh, trying to find another district to co-op for us because it is evident that our sports numbers have been declining and for next year's sports fall, at the fall, we are going to need to co-op with another district for girls soccer, boys soccer, and football. So um, without giving any other districts names, I will tell you that I have personally have reached out to six other districts. Two districts are interested in co-oping with us. It is a pretty complex process in terms of figuring out logistics. So I don't want to share their names yet until they're committed. Uh, we, are, um, we have had several meetings uh, with the two districts, and we're in the process of figuring out um, some of those logistics and costs. So when you co-op with another district, there are additional costs for transportation, whether we go there or they come here, and um, all of that. So I anticipate that we will have some more news at the next time that we meet with a determination on that co-op process. Um, I have asked Mr. Peranto here tonight to share a little bit more in detail about the sports program um, and share with you about the anticipated numbers and his strategic plan to sort of push out um, more information related to how kids can sign up, what programs are we are offering, and so without further ado, Mr. Peranto. Thank you. So Ms. Gogan, uh, Dr. Gogan spoke um, almost to the T about what's going on. As people maybe don't realize, just not here in our school district right now too, but it's throughout Massachusetts right now. Uh, just in our Southern West County League, um, we just had another team that has 1,400 students um, in their, in their whole district, they just decided they're not gonna have JV softball right now either. So it's just not our district that's losing athletics right now, it's across the country probably, if it's just in this area right now too. 
um, how to remedy the situation is, um, you know, a lot of people don't know. So, uh, we're going to brainstorm it uh, in our AD conference a little bit. Um, you know, the prob the what I plan on doing is we're probably going to we are going to run some type of free clinic for the uh, younger kids, Park Ave, Webster Middle School for our district right now, uh, with our coaches being there. Uh, during this this spring, we're going to find try to find a weekend that's going to be, uh, hopefully it'll be a, a good weather. I'll, we'll promo it through Facebook, as well as have flyers go out to the kids and the parents um, to try to promote our programs uh, more here at the high school. Um, I think having our athletes here, our current athletes, as well as our coaches, maybe they can promo their own programs right now. Um, um, obviously, suggestions that from anybody else would obviously be. Uh, would be greatly appreciated, but like I said, it's there's no there's no direct answer right now. Um, the pandemic really hurt a lot of things, um, made the kids, um, you know, it was easy for them to stay home. Um, but now we're trying to rejuvenate them right now too, and hopefully we can get them back into the uh, the field right now. Our middle school programs are thriving still. Our basketball programs were were pretty good. Um, our boys, uh, middle school basketball program for the boys program was the numbers were uh, jumping out of the seams. You know, we had 48 kids that tried out, kept 27 kids in the team. The girls program was still, you know, at, at decent numbers at 12, 13 kids. Uh, currently for our spring sports now, our girls track program is like 25 kids, 25 girls, I should say. Boys are at about 15. Um, the, the middle school baseball program is at about 20 um, 25 in the girls' softball program. Um, in, you know, so I think that it's going in the right direction. It's the key of trying to keep the kids inside this own district right now, too. Uh, we lose kids either going to vocational school or school choice, wherever it may be. Now it's trying to you know, keep, capture the kids and keep them here in, this, in the school district. Um, any questions? <laughs> It's, it's an ongoing thing. Like I said, it's, there's, there's no direct answer right now. Um, we bang our heads as athletic directors right now, just wondering how we can get the kids to come out right now. Um, we're hoping that, you know, you know, we can turn the page right now with that, that pandemic, I think, hurt a little bit. Um, but just in general, you know, baseball is a dying sport right now, too, as we know throughout the country right now. Uh, people just aren't playing it. We know that a lot of kids specialize. Uh, they play a certain sport and they specialize in that sport and they only play one. The, the, the true three-sport athlete is gone. Um, I noticed that when we do our athletic banquet at the end of the year. Uh, very rarely you'll see that kid that's a three-sport athlete right now. Um, they're far and few between right now. Um, you know, We try to stress that at our, at our preseason meeting to the parents right now. Uh, they leave there thinking that the kids are going to play. Um, and for other reasons or not, they just decide either A, they're going to stick with that one sport, or B, they're going to go get a job, um, or, you know, they're not just at, at home. They're, um, we're hoping that the parents start to push the kids because it's the only time they can do it. You know, we try to stress that all the time to these kids is that this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity because you're going to work the rest of your life. This is sometimes to have some fun right now, um, you know, and, and be with your friends and peers and something you can talk about for the rest of your lives. Uh, good, bad, or indifferent, um, you know, and that's what we try to stress with athletics right now is that it's an opportunity that you're not going to have to work and it's something that's going to be fun and it's something you're going to have memories for a lifetime, though, too. Chair? Yes, Ms. Navarada. I thank you for um, addressing the concern and addressing it this early on so that there can be um, successful seasons in the fall for the Bartlett athletes. Um, I also want to commend you for not moving in the direction of pulling up seventh and eighth graders because then we would lose the integrity of the middle school program. And I think what you alluded to in terms of the numbers there, I, w I think we want to continue to keep that and encourage participation at that level. My other concern with pulling up seventh and eighth graders is then we have a middle school team of fifth and sixth graders playing against other towns, seventh and eighth graders. And that doesn't make any sense. So thank you for exploring. I just want to clarify something, if I may. Um, we have really been holding ground on not pulling the middle school um, students up. We're very fortunate that we started our middle school program about four years ago. And that's the feeder system into Bartlett. 
Um, but this spring, Mr. Peranto did apply for waivers with MIAA for some spring sports. We um, have said to him that it's only a developmentally appropriate, physically fit eighth grader who may be pulled up uh, and not at the detriment of the middle school team. So we won't allow students to be pulled up if it's going to negatively impact the team. So uh, I know spring sports signups just happened and I don't know where you're at with that, but this is the first time that he has applied for a waiver to pull the eighth graders up, not the seventh graders. So I want to just be clear with that. Um, that's for this season. If we join a co-op for the fall, we will have um, the broader opportunity of having teams. And as the kids proceed through middle school into the high school, we're hoping that we get more and more kids interested in sports. And you know, and coupled with the anticipated renovation and potential athletic field, um, that interest I do see turning around. So I just want to be. Apparently, clear I'm about really that. I'm really vaguely aware that any middle schoolers were currently playing at the high school. I think maybe I heard a one call for t boys tennis, but that was the only one that I had heard. I can I can speak a little bit more on that. Um, so, like we said, we did apply for those waivers, um, and like I said, there's, you got to understand, there's no formula that's foolproof right now either. But if you look at our Southern Western County League again, I go back to our league right now. Uh, and we're not saying that we're trying to be followers right now, but obviously if they're doing things right now too, then something is working for them. Um, so in all the smaller schools and uh, you know, the larger schools, even Tantaswa, who's the largest school in our, in our district right now, they're pulling seventh and eighth graders too um, because they can't field teams. And I'm saying it's, 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 it's right. No, no answer is right on this right now too. And we understand that the development of the middle school kids is, is vital. And uh, it is, does take a certain individual. So we, what we did with these kids for the eighth graders right now, we made the parents sign off on waivers, though, too, that they, that they know that these kids are coming and they want to support it, though, too. Because they're if far and few between that a kid is, is mentally ready for this challenge, though, too. Um, and we'd re we haven't had any ba uh, baseball kids that wanted to come up because they wanted to stay down. And currently we have no softball kids. But we did have tennis kids, which we don't offer in the, in the middle school program. So I think that's a great opportunity for these kids to, get to go out. Are they going to compete? Probably not, obviously. But they're going to be practicing every day because that, that sport is not offered. Uh, the other two sports uh, uh, potentially will be boys and girls track. And as we know, um, you know, girls at that age and boys, some kids can really excel at the track level to uh, and challenge themselves to be at a higher program right now. And they do more events at the high school because the middle school doesn't do as many events in, during their meets each time too. So I just wanted to explain what was going on with those programs right now. And we are not trying to, you know, take from our middle school program because that was one of the things that we stressed. And I told Mrs. Go uh, Dr. Gogan was that we are not taking the kids from there to, to hurt that program. If we, so if there was only 12 kids on the uh, softball team and it was four eighth graders and they had to come up, no, no one's coming up. We're going to make sure there's a middle school program. And we don't just want all fifth and sixth graders there because obviously the competitive level will be too high for them at that time too. So no, that's the explanation for how we're just bringing, well, for the, looking for these for, little for, bit eighth graders. From my perspective, I think the waivers are just for this current season. Uh, when we co-op with someone, we're not going to need waivers um, because we really want to protect that middle school program developmentally for kids at that age. And the last that we discussed, there were potentially um, two boys for track, uh, three girls for track at the high school from eighth grade, uh, three boys for baseball, one girl for softball potentially, um, and uh, probably six kids for tennis on boys and girls tennis. And tennis isn't offered at the middle school. So I don't see the waivers as a solution. I want to be really clear about that. We've really held ground until all of this has come up. Um, but I am, I'm excited about the potential of a co-op. I will say that. Um, and to have two potential interests at this point is very good. We're hoping to um, have more information in particular about the cost. I think that's really important that we look at what the transportation costs are going to be, um, but we are committed to make sure that there's sports for the kids in the fall so that they can play. Mr. Uh, Adamopoulos. Does this require my 
And my understanding is mine both school sizes, so what is reason? That is correct. Um, the MIAA needs to accept the, the uh, approval of the co-op. Um, so in it, in the in the rule book in the handbook it says it's a six month process, but it isn't because we checked with the MIAA right now too. Um, you know, so we're confident that once we figure out what school that we are going to co-op with, um, we can get the paperwork in in a timely manner so that we can get these accepted. Hopefully, um, how the divisions do work though. Um, is they'll take both enrollments and normally you would have to go up in a division then too. That's how it you know, normally would work. Not in your conference, but in your division. So if you currently were in division, actually uh, one of the schools is division five, we're division four. So you could end up moving up one more division. Uh, right now, without looking at obviously state t tournament titles right now, we're trying to survive programs right now. And this isn't a long-term thing. Um, you know, this is an ideal situation, believe me. Um, you know, the co-op is something that, you know, it's, I don't want to say the last straw, but it's something that we, we're able to have our kids be able to, to compete still um, and be on teams for next year. Um, we're hoping that, you know, within one or two year period and the middle school programs really start to thrive, then our, our programs are back surviving, uh, thriving again. So, yes, the answer is yes, MIAA waiver and B, that, potentially we could go up. But I could also file an appeal um, for to the MIAA to keep a, you, us, in, or whatever team we decide to go with in that level division right now. Can I just add a comment while you're thinking? Um, just in, in regards to the moving up of the division for clarity, it, the kids would still play who they would play, and the division move up is only if they make the state or, or the competitive level. So that's when it when it impacts them. They'd still play their, yes. Yes, so when they move the kids up in the division, it's for the championship games. And I think that clarity is important. It puts a different yes. spin on things. Um, and um, you know, I think we're learning a lot. I'm certainly learning a lot about athletics through this process. Um, but I promise to keep you apprised of the uh, co-op status. Yes, Mr. Adamopoulos. Um, is it a one year at a time co op? For example, if we get the team coming up, varsity, are we able to break from that commitment? Or have the school break from that co op? How, how we're going to structure that? They're all one year commitments right now. So that's something that we'll be discussing with the. the potential other school right now that they're on the understanding that it's it's under a one-year commitment right now so you have to file for to the miaa each year when you plan on doing this yes so we'll have to look at our numbers um you know so potentially for the winter and the spring obviously our springs uh numbers are low um so we'd have to look into see if that would be the case with this one of the schools that we're looking for right now. So we could file each season, even though it's a six month commitment. So we don't, it's hard to justify, you know, in the fall, what you're going to have in the spring. You don't know what your numbers are going to be really. Kids might say they're going to play and then they decide not to play though. But we will have to get that in within a two month period, I think is the, the number is about two months to the MIAA. Through the chair, Ms. Klein. So um, thank you, um, Mr. Pronto, for, I'm looking at your fall 2022 athletic participation motion. I think um, that's that's a great plan to get in front of the kids that are coming up, um, Park Ave right through middle school. Um, I think too our you know the big goal with co-op is because we have such a strong middle school program. We don't want those middle school kids coming up and just jumping right into varsity. Um, so I'm hoping with the co-op we can we can actually field JV teams again. Um, is that, have you checked out numbers for the two districts that are looking to co-op and is that a possibility? That's our ultimate goal. Um, looking at the district that we just spoke with today, we were hoping that with the boys and girls soccer program, we'll be able to field JV teams. You know, you may have juniors playing on, on JV teams or potentially even some seniors playing on JV uh, going by the skill level. And we're hoping the same thing for our football program, which we haven't fielded a JV team in probably four years, actually five years now. 
I think we it's the same for GV. soccer as well. Yeah, so that was, you know, it, it's important too, I think, for safety, right? Because I, I feel that even some freshmen that, that come up, they don't, they're, it's too daunting to go to a varsity team um, as a freshman, and that might dissuade some students to play as well. Um, so with the 25 softball, do we have enough? So are we gonna field the JV team? How is that gonna work? Because there's 25 girls, right, for softball? That was for our middle school. Oh, I was so, so excited. <laughs> so, so right now- <laughs> We're this, gonna have JV for varsity. Right now we're just fielding uh, varsity baseball and varsity softball. Okay, um, and I know that, one more question, sorry. I know that you mentioned baseball kind of being a, a dying sport um, around the district. A lot of other schools offer lacrosse. Is that something that we would look at, or? At one, point, at one time it was. Uh, the former athletic director, it's been 10, 12 years now, uh, Mr. Langevin was the former lacrosse coach at Nichols College, and he tried to start the program up. It's a very expensive sport. Um, we do have the field for it, but we just don't have, and we, we surveyed kids, and there wasn't the there wasn't anybody that really signed up. There was, I think there was two kids that signed up that didn't have any equipment, they didn't play um, in any AAU or club sports at that time, so they just wanted to try it. Um, so there was real no great interest in it at that time. And that was just two, before the pandemic, I did a survey because it was one individual that came to me. Thank you. Well, um, through our district right now, you know, the, we've noticed that the the elite kids are going on to um, the private schools, which is hurting us, um, as well as the girls. Uh, we've noticed that the private school out in Connecticut is gathering a lot of these elite athletes right now that that go that, that are coming up the ranks right now. Uh, it's not the AU; they haven't they haven't they haven't come to that yet, but it's coming. I think is that they're going to start having AU programs like during the winter season, during basketball season, because these kids all think that their rankings will get them um, college scholarships. Um, but it's proven case with St. Peter's right now that it's not because not one of those kids is ranked. Who's the chair? Ms. Millett? Um, I'm glad to see something's finally getting addressed here. Um, but one of my biggest concerns is the letter we've received. And even though we cannot vote on something like that, we do respect all student and parent concerns. My concern is that a suggestion, and I'll use that terminology, it uh, shouldn't even be made that it not be brought to the committee, um, that it would be handled in another way. Anybody, student or parent <clears throat> or staff member who has a concern should be able to come to the committee with that. Even though it may not be something we can vote on, we can find a way to address it. My other concern was that ultimately, Recruiting is your job. And I think what I'm hearing is that there isn't enough of that happening. Even, I know when I was teaching, which wasn't that long ago, we had information plastered all over the school about sports. Um, and I'm going to agree with, the, with Superintendent Gogan with these renovations coming up and i'm going to say they're coming up because i'm going to be positive <laughs> we need a good sports program to bring students in we were and i wasn't teaching that long ago having students from other towns come here mm -hmm. for sports douglas different schools were coming here they're I'm sure there's a way to get information and people to those schools 
to get some recruiting done and within our schools. And, but it's not the student's job. They can talk about it at a meeting, but ultimately a lot more recruiting has to be done. And I think it goes hand in hand with these renovations. It's part of the whole program. Going to have a whole new wonderful building in the atmosphere of it and be able to use that section of the building for a lot of different things, which includes more sports. And to do that, we need to up our ante here. And student, we may say students aren't interested. Guess what? We need to get them interested and show them an interest in wanting to do these things. There are a lot of, all these same sports are done right here in town, on the town side. Are we at summer programs recruiting them for the school side? I think it's a lot to think about, but it goes hand in hand. And I will say any concern does not need to be prevented from coming to the committee. Even though we can't formally address it, we can find a way to address it, just like we're doing now. It should have been not tabled to do a different way. The concern still should have come to us. Thank you, Ms. Millett. Just a couple um, thoughts that I have, Mr. Pronto, as well. First of all, thank you for um, the plan, the field day. I think it's definitely a step in the right direction when it comes to the recruitment of student athletes. One of the many things that we have going for us here in Webster is that students don't have to pay to participate in sports here. That is something that is unique to Webster that a lot of other towns can't say. Judging by, um, you know, Again, like Ms. Millett said, some of our town sports, I, you know, I can say that um, sometimes it can be hard as the kids get older to have, you know, enough students or enough athletes to participate. But um, I definitely think giving kids an opportunity to participate in an organized sport that they may not otherwise have the means to do, because as we know, town sports involve cost and that sort of thing, uniforms that you need to purchase. Um, some other neighboring towns also do clinics over the summer where um, not only do you raise funds because you can have, you know, um, people pay to participate, but you get kids from all over to come and participate in these activities, student athletes that can help run the activities, and that can also drum up some interest, you know. Um, I know my kids got exposed to a lot of different sports in a neighboring town last summer by participating in those types of clinics, and they loved it. Um, and just to touch upon the recruitment piece, Maybe you can tell us a little bit more. I'm sure that there's other things that are going on with regard to recruiting student athletes, coaches. I know my daughter was on a soccer team last year and the coach was doing double duty with the boys and the girls. Can you just walk us through a little bit about um, either what you have been doing or what your plans are to, to um, have more coaches and more, more students participating? Well, that's a great question. Um, now it's... It's, I talked to Dr. Golding about this too, is that, you know, um, the teachers that we're, we're bringing into district right now don't have an interest in it. Um, so grabbing, getting coaches that were teachers, it's, those days are far and few between right now. Um, person that came out of college and jumped in and wanted to coach right away. Um, it's, right now we have, we're having a difficult time finding coaches, as you know. Um, you know, we, we advertise it. We put it out, um, you know, through our through our Webster district first, and then we advertise it on the outside. Um, and we're still not getting any potential people that are interested in coaching right now. Um, I I don't have the direct answer for that. Um, you know that we I have to normally go and get people to coach, so that way we have a coach. Um, and if we didn't, then we wouldn't have a program. Um, so I have to personally go tell people and beg, plead, or whatever I may do to get these coaches to step up and go coach a sport right now. Um, you know, we do far and few between, again, interviews uh, with multiple people, candidates going to uh, go to a varsity job. 
Um, normally, we're just going to, you know, at, politely asking these coaches or people in the building, may you please come coach for us right now? Or if it's outside the district, that somebody was coaching a town league and say, can you please and can you come help us out and coach a team right now? Um, again, we're having a hard enough time getting kids. We can't get coaches either. Uh, like Mr. Millett said, though, too, I think the, the, the best thing right now with this, hopefully with this new building project right now, um, offering the kids a state-of-the-art uh, facility, that could attract people. We know, saw that our neighboring town, when they put up their turf field, at that year alone, we lost eight kids when that football field went up there and their new track. Um, so we're hoping that maybe we, with our new facilities, we can attract these kids or keep them here in this district because we're, we're offering them state-of-the-art facilities right now too. So definitely, I think, hoping that the building project comes to fruition will help us, but maybe more to be done or more thinking to be done with regard to recruitment, you know, both for students and for the coaches. And that's something that, you know, while, while you're sitting here in front of us and you're bearing the weight of that, that, you know, it takes a village mentality, I think goes a long way. All of us can, you know, put our thought capital together to try to figure out a way to, you know, drum up some more interest there. And just one other question or comment maybe about um, interest has to do with communication. So I know that as a parent, I receive communication um, related to the grade level that my student is in. So I, I imagine it goes out to all parents of you know students of that grade level. And I wondered if that might be something, because right now I'm relying on my 11 year old to let me know when things are happening. Um, sometimes I find on Dojo or something like that, um, updates about sports, and I did find something on Facebook also, but I wonder if email, that's something that it's already available. We have those lists already created. Um, that might be a double-edged thing where we can also get more students. Maybe maybe a parent will want to step forward and coach, that sort of thing. That has been brought to my attention. Um, so that's one of the avenues we are going to go now. We can't rely strictly on the kids anymore. We can't rely on the kids bringing their flyers home. Um, because they get lost in their backpacks. So we are going to attach parents to anything that we have athletically now too. Great, good deal. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments from the committee? Thank you, Mr. Peranto. Thank you. Moving on in the agenda, the next item is the Bartlett High School renovation update. Thank you. We have some special visitors here tonight. I'm pleased to introduce our OPM, John Bates, and our designer, Kent Kovacs. Um, we would like to give a presentation to the school committee tonight. I know we've been on the road show, um, and uh, many of you have attended those road shows. Thank you very much. Um, but we wanted to make sure that the school committee saw the most up-to-date um, presentation um, that we have been sharing with the community. I would like to say that Every time that we have given a presentation, whether there's one or two or six or ten people at the presentation, we've had positive feedback. And um, I'm happy to um, toss it over to Mr. Kent Kovacs and Mr. John Bates. There we go. Can you hear me? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure working on the project. Uh, we've been here for quite a while. Started with the feasibility study where we looked at the existing building. We met with the teachers, we met with students to get a lot of great ideas, and all that was put into a district educational plan that the superintendent will kind of highlight in a minute. Um, but what we want to share is a quick video, it's about two minutes, and then we'll go into the presentation. I'm thrilled that we're renovating as opposed to rebuilding, recycling the need Financially audio makes sense for decreased waste in landfills and preserves the history of the existing building because there's a lot of history in Webster and there's a lot of pride that's associated with being a Bartlett High School graduate and I think passing that on to our kids is really important. The timing for this project couldn't be better because of the work that we have been doing looking at a realistic way to improve our educational programming. We've just become an Innovation Pathway High School. We're in the initial phases of building what we can offer here. 
There's a real need for our kids to get engaged in hands-on learnings, and that's really hard to do in the spaces that we have. And so this renovation really helps us build off of what we already have in place at Bartlett. Transforming the learning spaces, that's what we're trying to do, so that students are more engaged and able to do things and create things in a different way. So would students get like a certification or something to work? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's all about getting you guys certified. So whether you go to college or you go into the workforce, you'll be more equipped. Yeah, that's awesome. So that whole cafeteria gymnasium is going to be like a community wing. So we could hold events. So when you guys do all your choir stuff and yeah. the band stuff, it's all there. And then they don't have to worry about coming through the Yeah, whole like building. tracking through the whole school. I feel like the whole vibe of the school with like the white and everything will make it feel a lot better. Well, the whole idea in the front is that everyone that comes in is going to see what the students are producing. So whether it's your advanced manufacturing lab or the makerspace, that's going to be the main focal point. And so students can display what they're making. And it makes you want to go in. Yeah, it makes you want to be a part of it. So that was a, I would say, like a nice summary, like video that recapped the whole feasibility phase. But I think what's important to stress here is it took six times for a statement of interest and that's expressing the need for this project to the Massachusetts School Building Authority. And so there were six times that the district went out um, and then finally got invited in. That's a big deal. That's a long time. And I think where we are right now, you guys are in a great position to um, take advantage of the state grant. They, last April, uh, August, they looked at this renovation project and through the state they approved the funding uh, and for us to go forward. And what happens is if you don't take advantage of it and if everybody doesn't get out to vote um, this spring, you get bumped to the back of the line. There's no exceptions. You're not, hey, let's go and vote it out in another month or two. It's not how it works. So, you know, it took eight years, you know, probably six to eight years to get to where you are right now. You get bumped to the back of the line. And it's not because they don't believe in you. They believed in this school the moment they responded and said yes to the same in it. They toured your school, they understood that your spaces didn't meet state standards, and they knew it was not conducive for learning. So I just want everybody to know um, kind of how serious this is, because there's other districts, hundreds of districts that want your money. <laughs> and, and that's really, I don't know how else to say it, but uh, I can, I'm the architect, I can kind of play like, I don't really know how it works. But that's how it works, and and so, and and so they, you know, they're looking to you um, to kind of step up the plate, and I hope like everybody, you know, uh, kind of understands that. But we're going to just show you a, a presentation that talks about the educational vision, and I think all the hard work that was done by the district and the teachers, and everyone saw the kind of the video. But. With the MSBA, it's, it's, it's a grant agency, but they're very diligent. They want you to get it right. Mainly they want you to get it right because they don't want you to come back in 10 years and ask for like another school building project. So they have um, representatives from DSE who represent special education. They have directors on the board who are part of their science initiative. So they have all these high profile folks that are um, crafting how education not necessarily like should be delivered, they kind of want you to craft that into what Webster's all about, but they're highlighting on how they see education going in the future. And so it's heavily vetted, and the educational program that the district submitted um, was received um, uh, very well, I think probably better than most districts, 
and uh, it was well written. It touched base on like how you are locally, how you see yourself kind of within the Commonwealth, um, and especially like your need for um, special education because there there is a high demand, probably more than we see on a lot of public school projects for specifically to Webster. Um, and just so for instance, there's a slide that's coming up. Um, Webster has double the amount. So if the state would give you 4,000 square feet of special education space, after going through the educational vision and understanding the needs, um, the district requested 8,000. And that's just to meet what you currently are doing and what you project doing in the future. So what's great about this program is the MSBA allows you to craft it. They have a template, but they expect you to craft it into what um, Webster needs moving forward. Um, and, and, and with that, I think I can go through a couple mm -hmm quick slides and then you can kind of, you know, summarize it. Um, if you want to, you know, take over, Superintendent. Certainly, we can, te we can team it. Um, I, the school committee knows certainly what we're trying to do here in Webster is really beef up um, our, on our existing programs. We know that students have changed. We know the job market's changed and we know that we have to challenge our students in a different way. The timing for this project is, it's true. It couldn't have been at a better time. We have recently become an innovative pathways high school. We're developing our health and human service pathway. And the process of developing what we wanted the building to look like um, was really um, remarkable because we can feel it and see it now. We can see what it's going to feel like, those spaces for the advanced manufacturing, the maker spaces, the uh, neighborhood clusters of having um, teachers be able to have workspace and students be able to have workspace, the having natural light and outdoor spaces with the existing building has really been remarkable. I think the one thing, Kent, that you said that I just want to double stress here is that uh, going back and forth with MSBA has been a very long and complex process. And we've been very honest with them about who we are, what our needs are, and where we need to go, and what our plans are. And they have um, really wrapped their arms around us to the point where we just received notification that they are um, going to grant us all of the special education spaces that we have requested for reimbursable costs, which is, I'm sorry, unheard of. Um, but we need them. And so they've taken a, a deep dive on what our needs are. They see what we've been trying to do here. And um, they support that program. I think one of the things that is also tied to our sports um, conversation here is that things have changed, right? And so we have to become a little bit more creative with our outreach, with our parent communication, with our PR about what we're teaching. And coincidentally, tonight you're going to look at the program of studies, which is very different than it's been because the pathways and the options for students have changed. And what we're trying to strive here from central office down through the principal, down through the teachers, down to the students and the families is that kids need to be engaged in their choices, what types of classes, and we want to give experiential learning. And the spaces that we're going to be able to create um, every student is going to have that opportunity to try something different to figure out who they are. And quite frankly, that's our job as educators. And I'm so excited about this project. And it has been a long road. And we've, we've really um, been very fortunate to work with you guys and MSBA and all of everyone here. Um, so it's going to happen. <laughs> And you've heard me talk all about these slides, so I'm not going to read them to you. Yep. I'll just jump in. And just, and just uh, the superintendent um, <laughs> spoke about some of the special education spaces that they supported. They also supported for reimbursement in core academic, the advanced manufacturing, the health care. There are some English language specialist classrooms that we asked for for support. That's in core academic, not special education. So they really do look at their default template. And if you add to it and you justify the need, which this district did, they recognized it and they contributed to reimbursing for it. So that's a big deal. There's a lot of square footage that they contributed. Again, um, they take it serious. It's vetted not just by a small group, but by the entire MSBA. Uh, the, the chair is our state treasurer uh, that we met at the board of directors meeting. And um, so we're in a great position and we're moving forward with their whole support. 
but just some kind of background information. This is what we've been sharing with the different groups. Um, before we got into the overall planning, you know, we, we met with the teachers. We had this kind of model over here. And we began just diagramming, like how would this building function better? Or if it was new construction over in the field, let's just strip it way back. Like how would you want to function? Uh, how would you want to navigate? How would you want things divided up? And it really came into a district um, focus wing, an academic wing that had core academics, but also was infused with innovation and different kind of career you know, oriented programs that were built into the ed program. And then I think most importantly, and this comes to you know, how you can really intangibly use this building, the community wing, where you have the auditorium, the gym, and the cafeteria, where you can basically break it off from the rest of the building. That helps with supervision, it helps with security, and also operation of the building. So if you wanna use the community wing during the summer, you can downshift the rest of the building. Um, and so we kind of look at it holistically, like programmatically, how would you break it off to understand who's coming and going for control, but also how do you want to long-term operate this building? And that's going to come to, you know, long-term operational cost with, with, you know, kind of what you see. And it's as simple as just creating these bubbles. Because if we had the CAF over in the district wing, that means those mechanical systems are going to be turned on, you know, as well as, you know, this. So we're able to kind of uh, strategically, you know, focus where our energy needs to be spent. Kent, just one comment before you change the slides. I think this is important for anybody who's watching at home. So um, the pre-K um, classrooms are going to be moved over, three of them, to Bartlett High School. But I think it's very important for the community to know that there will still be a K-1 transitional kindergarten at Park Ave. And the other two spaces at Park Ave will be designated for OT, PT, and services related to kindergarten and, and the transitional program. And MSBA gets so detailed that those rooms have to be reserved for that over at Park Avenue School. So I, I wanted to put that out there for anybody who's watching. And, and just as a, kind of the smart strategy with that, the MSBA recognized pre -K -K. and they are reimbursing. Oh, I, it's pre-KK, I'm sorry, I said the wrong thing. Pre-KK. Yeah, and, and, but the MSBA just kind of carrying on this reimbursement kind of strategy. They are reimbursing for those three pre-K classrooms. So as part And then of I just for clarification, I just want to be clear, I'm a little tired. It's a pre-KK transitional program, not a K1. Doing. So we have I'm sorry. Oh, go. Yep. Can I just add with the innovation, I think we need to um, bring up mastery and the new program they want to do with mentoring our students yes. to jobs in their company. Yes. And this, once again, would only kind of advertise to the rest of the community to bring more partnerships into, into the mm -hmm. school. You're going to hear a little bit more about some of the partnerships um, later on. Uh, and so just going back to the pre-K and the internships and what we're trying to do and give every student some sort of experiential learning their senior year, having pre-K, students will be able to walk down the hallway and be in a classroom with the actual students to learn whether they want to do a career path as a paraprofessional or a teacher. Um, so we're going to continue to build that uh, it's not just health and advanced human man, advanced manufacturing and health and human services. With a maker space, we're trying to give kids opportunities to use the maker space to do advertisements for sports, for a show choir or a cappella groups or the theater. So there'll be a lot of ways for our kids to interact in our community and in their school and giving them real life experiences that they can either take to college or to a, a, a job. Great. Thank you. Um, so I'll just step back. I kind of touched upon this before. Part of the feasibility study when we first came on was to understand um, what this existing building can do. We do that because um, it will tell us if this building is conducive for 21st century learning and what you want to do in the future. So we analyze the mechanical system, the structural system, civil engineering, electrical. Uh, there's no sprinkler system in here. That's kind of a quick one. Um, so you have an older building. We want to look at their conditions and mainly to determine are they at the end of their useful life and what we need to target. So that's fine on building systems, right? Mechanical, the tangible. But when we look at real infrastructure, 
a couple pieces really jumped out at us. So one, the cafeteria. Now the cafeteria space in general, this is an add-on. It's between two wings. It's between A and B. It's an infill. Even the way it's designed, it's an infill piece. Um, it also has multiple ADA violations. So if you're in a wheelchair, you cannot get to the different tiers. And so part of this, it's a great space looking out, but it's not ADA compliant and we wanna fix that. Also all the glass and then the roof sloping down doesn't have any insulation. It's very thermally um, um, not meeting today's standards, essentially, the whole building is, is like that. And so part of this building project, we need to bring the entire exterior envelope up to today's standards, insulate it, insulate the roof, and it's it's essentially the same thing, you know, if you're a homeowner and, you know, you, you want to add insulation to save on your utility bills. It's exactly the same thing. And so we're looking for, like, the weakest performing pieces, and the cafeteria is one of those pieces. Um, another thing that we see, and I'm going to uh, talk about this a little bit more, you have a lot of landlocked classrooms. When we first started the visioning sessions with the teachers, um, we were told that please do not design any classrooms that don't have exterior windows. <laughs> um, the, it's hard for temperature control. It's hard to you know um, cool heat and just regulate. And then there's no natural light. And you have a lot of these uh, interior classrooms as part of this original um, you know late 1979 design. Um, we don't see this anymore. And so that's something that we all of a sudden you know radars go up. We got to fix that because what can we put in those? interior classroom storage, you know, that's kind of a balance there. Um, and, and, and so we want to start looking at how to improve just what you have. Um, and then here, just this is an example of your thermal envelope. These are those uh, slope roof sections that we have some ice dams going on. So we want to correct that. You don't have enough insulation. But what this project does is we will bring your exterior envelope up to code. We will bring the roof up to code. We are targeting all the building systems. So if this is a renovation project, it will be new. It will be beyond code because we're striving to get 2% additional reimbursement by the state and meet their green standards. So we're already on track to go well beyond Mass State Building Code and satisfy LEED requirements and MSBA requirements for state sustainability. So that touches our acoustics within the classrooms. Um, so you're not gonna hear noise from an adjacent classroom or even the hallway. That's how tight this gets, um, because if we, uh, if you hear a noise out in the hallway, then that fails our acoustic rating, and you lose out on two percent reimbursement, and then you're going to come knocking on our door. So it's a serious thing, um, but but that's what's great about the MSBA is they have these protocols in place. So just some snapshots of existing wind uh, classrooms. We have uh, lighting that. Um, meets foot candle requirements, but there's new improved LED lighting that's more energy efficient. We can do a better job illuminating this classroom. Um, you have windows that won't close properly, and essentially these windows have no thermal quality at all. They're just keeping the wind out. And then thermal breaches here where you see the paint flaking off the gym roof. So we have moisture mig migration from outside to inside that we need to fix. Antiquated mechanical systems that uh, have to be fixed. And then just Classrooms like this that have this concept from the late 70s with the partition that moves. Here's a snapshot of the mechanical system. I, I guess why I'm saying this is whether you do this project or not, you're going to spend millions and millions of dollars to fix it, like, immediately. So, uh, and that's not part of the option with the MSBA. I'll go uh, through a slide in a little bit that talks about the code compliant option versus what this is, but <laughs> essentially, you have a lot of issues with an old building that need to be fixed. And most recently, a large, uh, heavy rainstorm, we have buckets collecting water from this uh, ceiling tiles. We don't know where this came from in the roof. It could be dripping here, but the source could be 100 feet away. So this is an issue. You can't track it. You need to rip everything out and, and reset it. Um, but kids shouldn't have to go to school with this, and it's a safety um, and teachers. Teachers shouldn't have to teach in environments like this either. And so some of the highlights, though, we do want to call out is by simply looking at those landlocked classrooms, something the teachers really said, hey, is there any way you can fix this? Um, and I just want to let everybody know, this isn't a heavy lift. <laughs> in our world, 
this is probably as light as it gets. Simply removing these, boom, you open up light. This isn't scary to us. This is commonplace for architects and engineers. But by taking those landlocked classrooms that you couldn't control the heat or the ventilation and had no natural light, you now can transform the interior of B-Wing. You're bringing in light to the STEM space, into the art, into advanced manufacturing, and you're utilizing outside space, which is great for natural light and just for kids to have relief. Um, and so just by a simple move like that, we're able to correct two problems. The media center or the library is in the current location. We are reconfiguring circulation, so we'll have elevator access, stair access that's more efficient to go to the upper level of B. This is a look at the upper section of B outside the library. Again, just kind of long corridors. We remove it. And a big part of this plan that resonated with the MSBA when they're evaluating the educational plan is how are you designating academic areas? Are you, you putting you know, one wing over here and one wing over here? And, or are you creating a neighborhood that's kind of all encompassing? And what's been put out is five general classrooms, teacher planning, student seminar, and special education, and that's a cluster. And there's three of those. Uh, there's actually four if you count on the first floor, but essentially it's not just a long corridor of classrooms anymore. Each neighborhood cluster is concentrated with teacher support, student support, and special education, all in one area, all happening within the existing shell of this building. And so this just highlights what happens when you go to the academic neighborhood in B. It's gonna be great, you're gonna be able to see what activities are going on. It's going to be more kind of community related and not long classrooms off the hallway. Um, this one we're really excited about. So now we're in C wing. We have the gymnasium that's off to the right, immediate uh, or off to the left. Immediate left is the entrance to the auditorium, but taking these walls out and reconfiguring the floor plate. This is the new uh, dining hall cafeteria. So we're in C-Wing. This serves as a great reception space for the gymnasium, for the auditorium, has a great connection to the outdoor entry plaza. And so this kind of promotes outdoor, indoor learning and experience. So we could have an outdoor dining uh, area immediate outside that glass. And when you come to the main entrance that you'll see in this next slide. So on the exterior, we're trying to respect overall the uh, landscape and the building and also because conscious, the brick's in great shape, so we can keep the exterior brick, but we still want to finesse these entries a little bit um, and also create better lines of visibility for security. And so we're looking at doing something like this. You can see that cafeteria that's been renovated in the distance, the outdoor dining area, and then clear lines of who's coming and going to the school. And again, we want to also focus on that and control uh, the students uh, when they enter the school into one point. And then we shift to the north side. So this is that large cafeteria that had the multiple steps with, that was not ADA compliant. And by removing this, because again, we took the cafeteria and we combined it with a new community wing, we're able to reclaim great natural landscape. And so on the north side, we can imagine some student gardens. We could imagine the art, the uh, advanced manufacturing, be able to spill out to the outside and take advantage of that. And then directly off to the right that you don't see, this would be the new pre-K play area. So we have enough kind of territory on the north side that we can maintain the high school experience, but still have the district-related programs with pre-K um, in the same area that kind of district office is right now. But this is what this project can do to transform uh, the school. These are just some snapshots. We added this when we started looking at uh, talking to the high schoolers, the middle schoolers. So whether it's a new or renovated project, you're going to get 21st century uh, spaces. This is a dining hall in West Bridgewater. Uh, this is a look at hallways and some outdoor classrooms in a project. Uh, kind of reimagined library that's more of a learning commons. 
we're focused on STEM space. So we're not there yet. So right now, we just finished schematic design. So we're probably at like the 10,000 foot level. So when we move forward, there's a lot of design that's going to come after that. We're going to engage the students. We're going to engage the teachers. And then that's when we're going to really mold what this project's about. So these are just snapshots of what these spaces could be. Um, this is a really cool space in West Bridgewater. It's a middle high school. Um, what's interesting about it is they wanted a common space that's outside of art rooms in a gallery. That's a maker space in the distance. And off to the right is an advanced film studio. And so they all converge into this common space and there's pinup areas. So they're really looking at, like, instead of just corridors or classrooms, how can we create this collegiate feel and have it more um, engaging? And that's kind of what they did. And we imagine some of these spaces you know, here at Bartlett. Uh, just another look at what we're seeing for libraries and media centers. We're not totally going to Starbucks like library loungy. We still want some control over that. We still want research base, but we also want to make sure that we're creating some environments that encourage varied opportunities for kids to study. Uh, athletics. So the gymnasium staying where it is, but we're providing new sports floors. We're going to look at the entire bleachers, uh, netting anything that we need to support the athletics internally within the building. And I think what's great, and maybe you didn't uh, see it in the plan, I might get there in a second. On the first floor, we're taking all the fitness. We're taking whether it's weights, fitness, aerobics, yoga, all that's going to the first floor. So part of that community wing, that's gonna be on the first floor. So it's, I think, better for uh, supervision. And then the basement the lockers still will be on the lower level with improved uh, supervision, but all the activities will be um, adjacent to your existing gym on the same level. And then the auditorium will be renovated in its current location, but we're looking at a balcony configuration. So we're looking at seats on the lower level and then getting a balcony connection from the second level. I'll quickly go through this. The superintendent spoke about um, on August 25th, that the school building committees, uh, after months and after years <laughs> of evaluation of the various options, so they looked at multiple renovations, they looked at new construction over in the fields, and then they looked at the renovation you just had seen that was submitted to the MSBA, and they supported uh, on August 25th for that to move forward into schematic design, and then most recently that was uh, approved with the funding agreement. Um, what, two months ago, whatever, yeah. And what's never been done before is the MSBA, in conjunction with the Inspector General's office, they do a story about a building. And this is typically a post-occupancy story. And they reach out to districts because the MSBA wants to tell everybody what a great job they're doing. Um, they're probably going to watch this and get to call me tomorrow, but that's all right because they're used to me. Um, <laughs> All right. Um, what they want to do is promote projects they think are great. And usually it's after they're built. And it could be about furniture, it could be about mechanical systems, it could be about sustainability. They reached out to us before they even went to the board meeting to give you the money for this project and said, We are so like, excited about this project because no one's coming to us with renovations that really met the educational program. And so in December, um, this is after that August vote, but prior to the funding vote that was a couple months ago, they promoted this project for all the districts across the Commonwealth. Uh, we had the superintendent there who spoke, OPM, myself, some of our um, consultants that kind of touched upon sustainability. And, and, and want to highlight a project that wasn't even designed yet. I mean, it's unprecedented. And then you have the inspector general out there charging money for people to like go to it. So <laughs> it's kind of a cool thing. Uh, they loaded on to the MSBA website today. Did you get the link? No. It's, so we'll share it with you. And so this is public and it's profiled. There's two projects profiled when you go to the MSBA's website. Now they have, what? 50 projects going on currently, and there's two projects they profiled, and you're one of them. That's a big deal. 
Um, so we're excited about this and I think everybody did a good job and I think that's why, as the superintendent said, the MSBA um, is your partner. Um, they like Webster and they want you guys to succeed. And I think, you know, that's why it's kind of serious going out to the vote that you, you know, you spread the, spread the word on this one. Um, quickly recapping, because, you know, we know we shared this at other uh, um, meetings and community forums. A lot of people say, why don't you just renovate it? So what we have up above, we have option one, the code compliant option. And we're required to look at bringing this up to code. That's why we have 17 consultants that go and evaluate this building. And so to bring it up to code, we have to meet accessibility. We have to meet a minimum for mechanical systems. Now that's heating and ventilation. There's no requirement for cooling or displacement. So at Park Ave, you have a displacement ventilation system. So that's beyond code. Um, and, and that's not luxurious or, or anything like that. But just basic ventilation and heat, this building needs an entire new system. Um, of course, if we're doing this, we're going to look at replacing any uh, floor tiles. We're going to paint the walls. And because we're putting in new mechanical systems and sprinkler systems, we're replacing the ceiling. We also, as a code, we would replace the windows, uh, the doors, and we would replace the roof. So this just gets you to code. It doesn't take down any of the walls. You do not meet state standards. Your typical classroom's around 750 square feet. To meet state standards for a typical classroom, it's 825 minimum. You do not meet special education spaces. You do not meet the science spaces for OSHA regulation. So you're not checking off the box for a whole, well, that's the, the columns that are not checked off further down there. Um, but essentially, we test it. There's four boxes that you need to meet in order to get into the grant, and you don't meet that with the code upgrade. So when we look at the overall cost, it's approximately $66 million. When we look at the renovation options, you track around 95. This is basically uh, uh, estimates we did at the previous stage that we're sharing with you right now. These have been refined. And then when we look at new construction, it tracks you know, almost $20 million over. Now, option two and three achieve the same thing. They, they achieve the same thing. It's just you could have it here in a renovation. Uh, this requires some module, modular classrooms and maybe some phasing. But for $20 million, you're not redeveloping the entire campus on the site, and you're not ripping this down. Um, so the school building committee reviewed this, and this was the most uh, economically feasible and educa educationally sound option, option two. So that is what was, was submitted to the MSBA, and that's what gets you to the grant. The code compliant, you don't get there. Um, just quickly going through, very simple. The building, the way it's designed, is conducive for that organization with the district wing, the academic wing, and then the community wing. We are not renovating the entire campus, but everything within the loop roads, we're enhancing drop-off, parking, pedestrian circulation, new exterior lighting, and new plazas, um, and new vegetation around the existing building. But we're leaving everything outside the loop road alone. Um, part of this we are studying because we know how important it is, is the potential for an alternate of the athletic field. What that means is we're carrying the cost of that, but we need to watch how the bids are going to come in um, probably 14 months from now. And if it can be built in and fit within that bidding with the contractors, there'll be a new synthetic multipurpose field, a new track, sports lighting, bleachers, concession stand, toilets, as you see here. We also will relocate the softball field, get two soccer overlays, um, and so you will have a completely uh, revitalized athletic stadium and complex on the east side of the site as part of this. Uh, just quickly, construction. You are renovating a project, so we will require phasing, and this will be phase one. We'll attack the C wing, so this is where the new mechanical will go in the cafeteria. Uh, the reason we're doing that is your cafeteria right now and mechanical is between A and B, so that stays online while we build a new one. 
So once C-Wing comes online, your mechanical system's in place, your cafeteria's in place, and then we renovate B. So you're able to swing kids around to the other wing, and we will safely isolate the midsection. Uh, part of this, we will have modular classrooms that you can see located um, to the south uh, of that bus loop that's been accommodated in the cost estimate. So then we go to phase three, we go to a wing renovation. We consider this, I would say our light lift kind of in the construction world where we're doing, we're leaving the district office alone. We're building in the community programs and advanced healthcare on the lower level. And then the upper level are renovations to science spaces. Uh, and then we will uh, work on the pre-K play area and the new um, uh, parent drop off and district parking lot in phase three. And then in phase four, we're essentially moving the modular, we're moving the modular classrooms out and then finessing the bus drop off. So everything is internal to this uh, loop around the campus, but nothing that we think is concerning. This is manageable. Um, it will be over 30 to probably 34 months within here. Um, but that's gonna be, I think, you know, just kind of part of the project of having a renovation. And then with that, I'll turn it over to John Bates of yeah. Colliers. I'll just, uh, I guess, kind of echo what Kent had said. The um, MSBA grant funding program is probably the best of its kind. My company works on K-12 schools across the region, and we find this to be true. Part of the reason is because of the process that you see in front of you is so prescriptive and well organized. It starts with the eligibility period, and then they, the district forms the project team. That's the architect and their OPM. We engage in the feasibility study, as Kent had described, and then into the schematic design phase, which we submitted to the MSBA in December. And now you'll see that we're currently in the funding the project phase, and that's about two years' worth of work so far. So a lot's gone into it, and we've got a ways to go. Um, we'll go to the next slide, Kent, and I'll give you a kind of a high-level overview of the milestones that we're looking at. So as I mentioned, in December of 2021, we submitted the schematic design package to the MSBA. They reviewed it, they had their comments, we responded, we worked uh, together and uh, came to a conclusion that they wanna move forward with the project as designed. Uh, in early March, it's still March, isn't it? March 2nd, I believe, uh, the MSBA board voted to approve financing or helping to finance this project. Uh, so now that means in May, uh, we are going to go to the town and we're gonna ask the town for their support to approve uh, this project. And pending a successful vote, we would go into approximately 12 months of detailed design as Kent had described, and then we would go into about 24 to 30, maybe a few more of those uh, 34 months of project construction. And as Kent had mentioned, that would be a phased construction process where students would be actively matriculating on campus during the construction process. Uh, we're targeting completion of fall of 2025. So this is a, a small snapshot of the MSBA's estimated total project budget worksheet. It's actually a much larger spreadsheet. This is what they use to calculate the project's reimbursement rate. So I'll point you to the top right corner there, 80% MSBA reimbursement rate is the maximum. Uh, so they've, uh, as we've described, uh, favored us in terms of the reimbursement rate. And I'll point you to a couple of numbers towards the bottom there, starting with $101.417 million. So that is the total project budget all in. That's soft and hard costs. Now, the MSBA projects that they can give us a potential uh, maximum facilities grant that's based on eligible costs uh, against the reimbursement rate of $53 million.453. Uh, and then that would bring a balance to the district of 47.963. So it's interesting here, as you think back to that $66 million, that was just for the code upgrade that Kent had talked about. That's replacing ceiling tiles, maybe some fresh coats of paint, fixing the, the roof, the leaks, $66 million entirely on the district with no help from any grant funding assistance from the MSBA because they are interested in supporting the education program and that's why they're helping us with this project. Um, so I think we can go to the next slide. And as uh, the superintendent had uh, pointed out, we do have a roadshow, and this is part of it. Uh, 
And uh, these are some upcoming dates. So we ask that you folks, uh, uh, a little outdated, but uh, <laughs> but uh, spread the word that we are uh, we are on the road and communicating the details of this project, and uh, looking forward to a successful vote in May. Our next parent uh, community forum is March 30th at 6 p.m. at Bartlett High School. And there will be some more in, in April. We, we just have to, have to do that PR. Yeah. And I believe that concludes our formal presentation. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. You did a great job. It's been a, a wonderful process. We have a very strong team. and. Um, I'm optimistic that we're moving the district in the right direction with all of this. So um, thank you so much, you guys, for that presentation. I'll just conclude my report quickly for you. Um, I did add a little bit of information about some students. Uh, the DECA students did go to Boston and some pictures and some highlights for you, and also the um, student council at the high school. Um, so I hope you enjoy that. I do want to let you know that um, we are in the midst of negotiations with the teachers, um, and things are going very well. Uh, we will be starting paraprofessional negotiations, and um, you know our district leadership team is, continues to work hard. Uh, our recent meeting was held on March 15th, where we um, specifically really looked deeply at discipline and uh, legal requirements, um, and we're busy. It's uh, March is the, the month of in education where everything starts to happen at once, MCAS, and you know we're back to normal. And um, so it's an exciting time and perfect time for the good weather and the nice birds to be chirping. So that concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Gogan. You're welcome. The next item on the agenda is the business manager report. Good evening, Mrs. Prangeli. Good evening, thank you. And the first item I have for you tonight is the school building committee update. Um, as you can see, tonight is focusing around our project. We're getting a lot of information out to the community. On March 14th, we had a four board meeting um, at the town hall. It was our first look at um, financial information, and we wanted to get it all out so everybody was hearing the same thing at the same time, so there was no miscommunication about numbers. Um, at that meeting, we discussed um, what the tax impact would be to taxpayers. Uh, for every $100,000 uh, tax increase, it would average about $164.90 um, for $100,000. The median house value in Webster is $262,000, so that would be an increase of $432.63 annually. So if you work that down to the day, it's about $1.19. Day. So that's what we're the information that we're getting out to the community. Um, we're hoping that people call if they have questions. We want to make sure they're getting accurate information. Our doors are open, mm -hmm. and um, we're going to be out talking a lot about that. Um, the support we are getting from our local boards has been fantastic. Um, the selectmen and finance are supporting this project, so we are excited about that. Everything. Um, Everything is looking good. We just need people to get out and vote. And um, May 2nd. yep, May second will be the ballot. That is, um, you're, you're going to be voting on the debt exclusion. Uh, there's no dollar amount at that vote. People go. It's just to give the town authorization to, for the debt exclusion. And then the following week uh, at town meeting, May 9th, that is the actual article where you are voting on the dollar amount the project. Um, in the article, it includes the full price of the project, the full cost um, of a $101 million, but that does not mean the town is borrowing $101 million. It means we have to include the total project cost. Uh, we get the reimbursement from the MSBA, so we're anticipating our, our final cost to the town, um, you know, on estimated about $49 million. Um, which works out to these numbers that you see there. So if you, you know, hear anybody with questions, point them in our direction, and we will be happy to sit down and have a conversation with them to make sure they're hearing accurate information. Questions about that? Through the chair. Um, only that at the full board meeting, the selectmen brought up 
to show more pictures of what the building looks like now, what the condition is? Are we doing that? Because they said that would be something good the voters should see is not just what it's going to look like, but the poor condition it is now. Mm -hmm. Are we doing that? So in That's a great point, Ms. Millett. I actually was making a note um, for myself to circle back to at another point. Um, that slide with the red checks that, right, that we check three boxes for whatever it is, $66 million, um, and we check all the boxes for $47 million, that is very compelling. You know, and for me, I think leading with the structural state of the school, the boiler, the roof, the windows and the lack of efficiency, you know, uh, the heating and cooling, all of that first, and then maybe explaining where we can get and, and what the investment is and where we'll end up uh, would be very compelling. So just a, just a thought. And you should have um, flyers that were made. These are great. Yep, and we'll be passing them out and putting them um, throughout the community for people's information. Um, so it's up to date. Right. Great. Yeah. Feedback. Um, next item I have is I should have actually put my um, items in reverse. Maybe I'll jump to three and then go back to two because that kind of segues into the project also. Um, maintenance update. Uh, mm -hmm. I brought to your attention at the last meeting that our high school boiler was completely offline. Um, that is still the case. We are just operating on the one small one, which which provides about 20% um, of heat to the building. Uh, it's enough to keep it lukewarm, but it's not enough to heat the building. Um, we are waiting for the parts to be finished uh, before it can get repaired, so the mechanic is ready to go. We're just waiting on the parts to be completed. Um, also, with the middle school HVAC update, um, that still is also a process in process. Um, we had to go out to bid, get some key quotes for that. Uh, it turns out it's going to, we're estimating a cost of about $12,000 to repair the HVAC system at the middle school. Um, so we just awarded that quote um, to a vendor and they will begin repairs. They are ordering the parts and getting that up and running. And um, I'll have to take a look at the maintenance accounts and maybe potentially move some money so I might um, be transferring some down the road. Um, so it just states that, you know, the buildings, um, the high school is certainly showing its age and um, the need for repair is, uh, if this was a month or two months ago, uh, we would have an emergency boiler on site for heat. Um, we wouldn't be able to stay open with just what, what we have now. So we really need to address these issues, uh, roofs, as, as you stated, uh, we have leaks that are just continuing to pop up uh, more frequently. Um, my office has been leaking for two years. Um, they have been trying to track down the leak for two years. It's just the way the roof's sloping and the building's running. Uh, these things are just continuing to pop up and, and get worse. Um, so we really do need to address the building. It's this last box right here yep. under the tax impact that almost we want that flashing red neon <laughs> um, to draw the attention to it because the, the potential cost is, is much greater to the taxpayers if we are not able to um, capitalize on this opportunity. Absolutely. And then I'll jump back up to number two, which is the single audit update. Um, in your packet, you have a copy of that. The single audit is a federal requirement. It comes in and typically looks at any large federal grants. 
Um, this past year, they focused, um, they always take a look at school nutrition, but they also focused on our COVID relief grants. Um, they, take a high, they took a high level at our Title I and Special Ed, but I'm happy to say that um, everything is good. There were no findings, um, so it was a good report. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Mrs. Peringley. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the committee? Hearing none, the next item on the agenda is the principal report. Good evening, Mrs. Parmley. Good evening. I believe I'm on here. So we've been super busy at Park Avenue. We've had some exciting events that I wanted to share with you. So starting off on March 2nd, we had our community reading day in which we had 38 readers join us, including many of you who are sitting here tonight. So we're very grateful for that. As well as some of our heroes from our Webster Fire Department, our public librarian, Moffrey employees, retired teachers from our school system, a children's author, and many community members. All of our volunteers were given a book that were chosen by our, um, that was chosen by our classroom teachers. Um, let's see here, the readers were invited to come to our cafeteria and Ellen Nyland and Stacy Easterling did an amazing job. They put out quite the spread of Danish and fruit and it was just really lovely. And so everybody gathered there. Deb Pushes, our reading specialist and our academic interventionist, not only designed the event, they also organized it from top to bottom and did a phenomenal job. We had students come and escort our readers to the classroom. Lots of smiles all over the building as our readers shared and enjoyed the time with the children. And then everybody regathered in the cafeteria where they received certificates and we were able to thank them. So I do want to give a big shout out to all who were um, able to join us for that day. I think it really meant a lot to our children, definitely, and to our staff that we were able to do that. And let's see, coming up, or actually we just had our kindergarten information night. Unfortunately, it was the night that we had that crazy snow kind of come out of nowhere. So we did not have the numbers that we usually do. However, the K team rocked it regardless. And they were able to talk about expectations. Um, as an admin team, we talked about, you know, the importance of attendance, how things roll out. We were able to explain the registration process and the importance of that school and home community partnership. It was a really wonderful evening. All the teachers took part as we were able to also open up a Q&A and be able to then mingle with the parents and answer any questions individually. Coming up, we have on March 24th, we're very excited. We have the MCAS information night and because Dr. Mackay was able to find a grant that was going to help us, Am I saying that correctly? Kind of. <laughs> we were able to have a family spaghetti supper night so that all the families who would like to come out and hear about the MCAS process for grades three and four, they're able to come out and have a spaghetti supper with salad and garlic bread and a dessert. And again, a shout out to Ellen Nyland and Stacy Easterling and their team. They're going to come out and serve for us, and we're going to go right through the food line just like students. Enjoy an Italian night out together along with music. We have our Barton um, NHS students coming out who are going to help us with our child care. We're going to have um, different stations set up in the gym, fitness stations. So we will start the evening with 30 minutes of just enjoying a meal around the table together, staff being able to mingle and connect with families. Our grade three and four team will be there. They will then send kids off to have a fun time in the gym and put on their own presentation where we have a PowerPoint slide and the teachers own that completely. They're gonna do an amazing job, they always do. And then we're gonna open it up for a Q&A. So we're looking forward to that. We've had quite the response. We were thinking maybe around 100. I think we're at well over 200 now that are coming. <laughs> so we're trying to figure out how we're gonna fit everybody in, but we're very excited. We're looking forward to it and we also have interpreters there for those families who did let us know that that was needed. And I believe our very last piece, we recently had a very special visitor to Park Avenue. His name is Ice. Ice is the cousin to Glacier. We have a young man who had not seen his father 
for over a year. He's been deployed and he received a one day pass to Massachusetts. And so we were able to arrange it. Oh my goodness. Oh. <laughs> That's awesome. It was it was a wonderful, wonderful opportunity, and we were excited to have him and to honor our veteran there that day. So, and that's all I have for tonight. Thank you, Mrs. Permley, for your updates. Any questions or comments from the committee? We're all crying over here. <laughs> we have, do we have any updates through Colin? Or are we um, going no, to I haven't heard from evening? Colin, but I will reach okay. out to him. I hope everything is okay. I do want to just okay, like okay. I just want to thank you, Mrs. Promley, and your staff for sharing that um, and creating that opportunity for our student and for everyone to enjoy. I think that type of culture building and the structures that you're putting into the place are what we want to continue to build on in our district. And um, you know, that, was, that was great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gogan. We were all speechless over I, I, here. I've seen it a couple I've times. I've seen it, so, but I would, yeah. 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 yeah, very nice, Robin. Oh, I can only imagine. He'll always remember that day, I'm sure. That's special. So the next item on the agenda under old business is a COVID protocols update. I want you to time me. This is going to be so fast. Okay. In the last two weeks, we've only had one student one week and zero staff. And then this past week, we had three students with COVID and zero staff. And that's it on the COVID update. Excellent. <laughs> 11 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> the next item on the agenda uh, is the grants update. Thank you. Um, I would like to um, have Mrs. Chapdelaine just share uh, um, a little bit about some of the grant opportunities that she is seeking for our district. Um, Mrs. Chapdelaine? Sure. So the last time um, we met, you heard about the Blackstone Valley Educational Foundation grant. We haven't stopped. So um, one of the grants that we are um, currently 
just about this close to receiving at this point is the Accelerating Mathematics Instruction for Students. It's the 22-23 program grant. It's $14,000. It's going to help with an existing program we've had for years at Park Ave since I think 2019 and that we implemented um, at the middle school a couple years ago as well. It will pay for the annual fee that we're required to pay. It'll pay for one year for um, Park Ave, which is $3,500, and then three years for the middle school, which is $10,500, which brings that whole grant up to $14,000. So I have it on good uh, standing that um, we, we should be hearing very soon in the affirmative. So um, we get excited because sometimes grants take more than one step in the process. So you submit your first form, and then you kind of do the happy dance when you hear back that you've been approved. And we got very excited when we got our second form approved as well. So we're done um, with our submittals, and we will keep you up to date as soon as that comes through. Um, we also, Webster, it's very exciting to be in Webster. I don't know what it is. It just, it seems like people are drawn to us. And so Google for Education selected Webster as a district who they um, were offering a $6,000 opportunity for 10 hours of professional development. We had to do something for that. We did have to fill out a, um, an application um, and there was limited funding, so we got right on it. And the very next day, we heard back that we were approved and we already have planned that professional development to take place for teachers on Friday. So um, we were paired with a company called Logic Wing. Um, they are one of the partner companies with Google for Education. And so we spent a great deal of time, uh, Michelle Bundy and myself and um, uh, Dr. Mackay was um, also helpful in this whole process. And we just, we did a survey with the staff to find out what their needs were. Um, you know, technology is one of those things we've had a lot of. <laughs> um, some of it maybe we haven't wanted to have as much of um, due to the pandemic. But there's so much that we can still learn about how we can engage our students in the technology realm. And so they're trying to pro provide us with a very customized professional development on Friday. And we still have some more time after that. And um, we may just offer our office assistance um, and um, some of our administrators some um, more advanced techniques as well um, on some of the Google applications. So that's what's going on um, with grants. And we have more grants that we're applying for. I don't know if you want me to touch on any of those. The, uh, the, skills, the capital skills capital grant, grant we're looking at. And um, because we're part of, because we applied for the, um, for the um, what's the first grant that I mentioned? Uh, Blackstone Valley Educational Foundation, I get emails on a regular basis because once they kind of wrap you in their um, world, they, they continue to offer opportunities. So we just have lots of things that we're working on. Um, it's an exciting time right now in Webster. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chapdelein. Thanks for pursuing all of these other opportunities for um, funds so that we can have these new programs. Anything else about grants? No? Great. Uh, the next item on the agenda under old business is a discussion and approval of the revised FY23 budget. Thank you. Mrs. Prangeli? Thank you. So Dr. Gogan and I had met with the town administrator and town accountant uh, last Wednesday, I think it was, um, to discuss the overall finances of the town. And um, as we discussed in our February school committee meeting, when we reviewed the numbers um, from the state, we saw a significant increase in our Chapter 70. Um, over the past few years, we have worked on an agreement with the town that we have been taking care of all fixed costs, which is your health care and any kind of benefits through the town. And then the remaining is split 70-30. So during that discussion, um, it works out that the school department is getting an additional six hundred and five thousand dollars, four hundred and thirty-eight, to add to our FY twenty-three budget uh, for next year. Um, our current budget showed a four point four eight percent increase, which came in at twenty-three million four hundred thousand. Um, that new number now, with adding the six hundred five, um, gives us twenty-four million zero sixty-seven eight thirty-two, um, which represents a seven. Um, so all around good news. Mm -hmm. um, we agreed with the town accountant, um, new town administrator. They support this plan. Um, 
it works out for both the town and the school. So where are we going to put the 605000 uh, Right now, our recommendation is to add it to the special education collaborative line. Um, in discussions with, uh, it was coincidental um, that Ms. Barris had approached me, the Director of Student Support Services, with concerns about the high number of special education students that are coming into our district and that are being placed. Um, so at this point, it's our recommend, recommendation to put it in that line, which would increase the total of the collaborative tuition to 811561 so with school committee approval, we are looking to that new number. And I'm, so, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mrs. Perangeli. Welcome. Are there any questions or comments from the committee? Well, hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the revised budget as presented. So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. Lori, would you pull the committee, please? Yes. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Just news. as a reminder, we um, have the tri board meeting on the calendar for April 11th at 6 p.m. at the town hall. Thank you. You're welcome. Town hall. Town hall. The next item on the agenda under new business is the approval of the Bartlett High School Program of Studies. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is an exciting um, rollout for the new program of studies at the high school. And tonight we have uh, Ms. Neves, our assistant principal from Bartlett High School, and uh, Ms. Chapdelaine, our director of curriculum, to detail the changes. I think um, before you start talking, ladies, I do want to give you a tremendous amount of credit for the hard work that you've done to dig deeper into looking very carefully at not only course content, but prerequisites for course content and the flow of pathways. So um, there has been a tremendous amount of work done with um, these two ladies leading it, but also with the teachers over at Bartlett High School. So uh, the change is difficult. I will say that anytime you look at courses and pathways, um, so there have been some difficult conversations and some decisions that had to be made, and they're going to highlight some of the changes. Um, but the again, I think uh, this is another piece of evidence of the growth that's happening in the Webster District towards um, improving rigor, content, and pathways for kids. So take it away, ladies. So I, I will just start by saying that, you know, I've been here almost five years now, which is just mind-blowing. But I've never been more excited about a program of studies book. Um, you're going to see that you have um, two, believe you have two copies in your packet. Um, one has lots of red, blue, and green markings in it, and I'll explain what those mean. And then another one, which is sort of the final draft, um, and so you can get kind of a look and feel of what the book is going to look like once all these wonderful changes take place. There's so many of them. In years past, I've been told that um, we would give you a piece of paper with the page numbers with the changes, and it just doesn't make sense to do that this year necessarily because just you can see the abundant changes that took place. But we'll give you a general overview. Um, but we are very excited about this because there's just so much in here that we we feel um, will be exciting for students um, once they get their hands on this book to be able to look through it and see the different offerings. And just being here today with the the building renovation project, everything's coming into alignment. You know, all the work that we're doing is kind of coming together, and it's just such an exciting time to be part of the Webster Public School District. So with that, um, I will start, and um, it's been wonderful working with Gina. There's been many hours. It's been a labor of love, this book, um, and so we're excited to share it with you. So um, I don't know if you want to start by looking at the book that has the, all the markings in it, um, but it, the book was designed... Uh, and adjusted to flow more consistently. Some pieces were in places that just needed to be moved to make more sense. Um, in this book, 
the, um, the red indicates deletions, the blue indicates additions, and the items in green that are crossed out indicate language that was simply moved to a green underlined location. Beyond the arrangement of the book, the following changes were made. Were made. Under the counseling section, and if you want to follow me on the clean copy, um, I, I have some page numbers that I can share, but under the counseling section, which begins on page three of the final draft that doesn't have the markups, guidance added in their scope and sequence another project that they worked on, which was their Naviant scope and sequence, which is going to benefit students. They did this at each grade level. So page three to five of the final draft, you will see the Naviant's piece. We also adjusted the marking system chart for course levels, quality point values, and numerical grade equivalent to correct and remove D minus, D plus, and F minus. And on the clean copy, that's page seven of the final draft. We added in descriptions up front for honors and advanced placement course levels. Um, and that's page eight of the final draft. And we added in the section for the innovation pathways up front, advanced manufacturing innovation pathway, and the healthcare and social assistance innovation pathway, and that's page 14 to 16 of the final draft. Regarding the subjects section, this is where a lot of work came in in terms of collaborating with teachers, um, and most particularly with the Bartlett High School ILT leads. Uh, Gina and I met with each academic ILT lead or representative from each department to review the new course offerings, course removals, course prerequisites, and typical pathways for each content area. So we actually drew pathways and pictures, and it was kind of a, an interesting process. Um, Bartlett High School was then provided with time on March 4th to actually edit course descriptions, um, you know, create syllabi or, you know, uh, improve syllabi or just update syllabi for all courses. And then they were also provided with the new course form to fill out for any new courses that we discussed. A placement test for students in grade eight at the middle school, as well as for any student entering Bartlett in grade nine through 12 who will be taking Spanish, um, will be offered. And that was noted in the program of studies. Uh, prerequisites for courses for eighth grade students entering grade nine and for any Bartlett High School student in grade nine through 12 moving to the next grade was also added with a lens on equity and the, the ability to um, really offer more course offerings to all students. And then I'll pass over to Gina. She's going to talk about courses that we added to the program of studies or for which titles changed and courses that were removed. Um, before I do that, I think one of the things that when Jill mentioned the pathways, our pathways are typical pathways, but students can go between them um, from a regular class to an honors class or vice versa. And we haven't really shown that before. So that's all detailed inside the book. Um, so in English, we added an elective for world literature and mythology. And we changed the title of our academic intervention, which was listed in here as ELA writing, reading and writing, to literacy skills and strategies. For ELL, um, the English language education, we've added a course for our newcomers, which is called English Language Development One. Within math, we have added um, our pathways. So we're adding in our second one, which is Advanced Manufacturing Innovation Pathway Course Number Two for Principles of Engineering. And we've also added in the third and the fourth course, which isn't offered yet, but it shows the years that they will be offered. So at least students can now see where they could go with this. Um, and within math, we also changed math strategies to numeracy skills and strategies. So same course, different title. In social studies, um, we've added back in world history and change the titles. So we have early world history for the years 500 to 1700 at both standard and honors levels and modern world history from 1700 to the present in both standard and honors levels. Some of our bigger changes happened within science. Um, we have a full year environmental science course that we added in, which is a lab-based course. We've added in our first pathway course, which is principles of biomedical science, and also showed the descriptions for the next three courses, human body systems, medical interventions, and bio, biomedical intervention um, and or internship. 
And like Jill had mentioned, we're adding in a placement test for our students, anyone coming from the middle school on up or any new student that's going to take language for the first time. So they don't necessarily have to start with Spanish one. They could, they may be ready to start with Spanish three or two or four. Um, music changed the history of rock and roll to history of modern American music. We just changed the title from drama to theater and health and physical education added in two new courses personal fitness and resistance training, and a course for unified physical education. And then we changed the titles for our special ed um, self-contained classrooms from life skills to life skills in functional academics program. And we didn't put Quest in here any longer. We've changed it to the comprehensive behavior academic program. Taken out a few things um, within English. We have, these were the half year electives that we've taken out that, and so took out biographies, autobiographies and memoirs, writing for your future. The, we took out the section on the junior and senior seminars, took out Marvel versus DC, poetry and film studies um, courses. And one thing I didn't mention is our, our journalism went from a half, full year to a half year course as an elective as well. Math removed Foundations of Algebra, Social Studies um, removed AP World, History of New England, Medieval History, and Contemporary Civil Rights Movements. And as a result of the science changes, we took out Biotech because the first course within the Innovation Pathways of Principles of Biomedical Science covers that. Um, we took out the Environmental Half Year course, turned it into Environmental Science for the full year and we've taken out AP environmental science um, and that's due to licenses um, and who can teach that. And with music, we removed music technology too and music and film. And I saw two small little edits within this book um, on page 40 and 41 that we'll make the change for. It's just the title was written wrong for intro to tech, it's intro to office tech. And the prereq for accounting should say successful completion of personal finance, not um, intro to technology. That's all I have. So hopefully you were able to follow us because I know you have two different books and it is confusing, but does anyone have any questions at all? Any questions, anyone? I mean, it's clear that there's been a lot of time and effort put into updating this um, program of studies. It's exciting to see what we have to offer. I, I also want to mention that um, we do have a team of people that are meeting um, regularly here in this room that are working on scheduling way in advance of when we have in the past. So we're really hoping that come the fall, all of the changes that are happening here are exciting a lot of people across the district because it's putting us in a place where come the fall, the kids are going to be in the right classes and less opportunities for, um, I don't know if you want to add on to I that. I have a question. Yes. Um, I just wanted to ask how um, you're going to go about communicating the new changes to both the incoming eighth graders and the students at Bartlett High School. So um, I think one of the things that um, we're continually trying to stress here is that parent engagement with students making choices about their classes. So how, how are you going to do that? So guidance has already rolled out um, a timeline to our students and they've started, the teachers have already started their looking at this today actually um, for their recommendations. But the guidance counselors will begin going into classes as of tomorrow um, to start talking to the kids on these courses. Um, and they'll have between now and April break to go through, bring these books home if they're approved, and work through what they would like to take and then submit them after April vacation. That's already been pushed out by guidance, that timeline, and they'll also be going to the middle school to present this. And the parent piece is the piece I'm trying to get out. The communication to the parents and then, again, the translation on some of this in, to be translated. I, I, I think that... Um, I think we have to make a concerted effort with all of these changes to make sure that parents are fully informed about the pathways, both at the eighth grade and then at all grades at the high school. So uh, we can maybe chat 
tomorrow on some ideas just to get that information to parents and keep giving it to parents because I, I think just from my perspective, um, it's overwhelming to look at all the changes, but if it's not, uh, if you're not sitting down with your parent, you may not um, have that conversation about, well, what is this? Um, and maybe I should try it. Or your uncle does the biomedical, and you might, this, this is, the, the, so we want to engage the families in a different way, I think, because a lot of work has gone into this, and I, I truly compliment the entire team, um, but I really want to make sure that parents are getting this information. And again, it's not just given to students. So we can chat tomorrow. And, and I'm so glad you, you said something about that because I'm, I'm sitting here scurrying trying to find an email because we just were emailing about this today um, with our um, SAUCE team. And uh, we're talking about providing clear and detailed talking points for school counselors, clear and um, explicit talking points for teachers, um, a blurb to be included maybe in the school and district regular newsletters to faculty and to families, posters that communicate directly to students to hang in the hallways. Um, the other thing I really want to make sure happens is that students, that students get a copy of this book, mm -hmm. not just the course selection document, mm -hmm. um, and that they can look through this and say, like what we're saying, wow, it's exciting to be at Bartlett. There's a lot of cool stuff going on. I'd like to see if I might be able to take this particular course and talk to their teachers about it. Um, and because the prerequisites are focused on that, that equity piece, which is so critical for the work that we're doing right now, there's, there's opportunities for kids to demonstrate um, the ability to take different classes at different levels, like Gina said. And so, yeah, there's a lot to be done, but that's a really great question and one that we had started to explore, but we need to do it quickly because course selection is is upon us. <laughs> Tomorrow. One, yeah. One so. possibility might also be um, taking a page out of Mrs. Parmley's book and having a gathering at the school. If you feed them, they will come. And parents and children, you know, coming into the school to really learn in depth about this program of studies. Um, it's a great opportunity to, to bridge that gap between what's going on in the building and what's going on at home. Yeah, and I kind of wanted to uh, piggyback on what um, Ms. Millett said, because um, it kind of resonated with me. You said we need a good sports program um, that interests our students. Um, and so I was thinking, and we need a, you know, to continue to enhance our academic program. So if we're able to do both of those, kudos. We're gonna, we're, Agreed. We're going to be ahead. Now is also the time that eighth grade families are determining where their students are going to be studying next year. So it's a great opportunity to get into the middle school yeah, and, and have another event at the middle school level to let families know that's a really good what point. we have to offer. Yeah, and we're trying to do this earlier. You know, we're trying to, I think over, over time, we'd like to move this course selection process up. January. January would be an ideal time to do it because February is getting tight and March gets even tighter. But um, we are ahead, right? We're, we're ahead of where we were at last year. Um, not only with the program of studies, but just with the scheduling process. So, and it's more complicated than we ever thought. Jean has been heavily involved. I had to do this. <laughs> yeah, I have to give most of the credit to this woman over here because she's she's been putting in a lot of time on this. I'm I'm just here to report. <laughs> you are more than you know. <laughs> well, so. the product speaks for itself. Dr. Mackay, did you have something you wanted to add, or were you volunteering to to write a grant for food for these events? <laughs> no, we, we, we actually have funding for that already, but um, I was thinking earlier when we were talking about athletics and now when we're talking about this that we really can't just go down to eighth grade, that we need to go down sooner. Mm -hmm. And so in thinking one of the things that, that I have to plan is summer programming, and so I'm looking for our, you know a collective approach to, the, to all the things that we can inspire our students to do and think about. And in thinking about maybe our sixth and seventh graders, to maybe do an exploratory camp in the summertime to have like a week of exploration of the innovation pathways. Mm -hmm. And while we're doing that, maybe have a week of exploration of sports um, during our summer programming. So while I appreciate the idea of camps for funding, that we, we're not gonna charge our students that what we can do in our summer programs for ourselves. And so why not have a collaboration for our current students, but get them exposed to it early 
right now, if we plan that for eighth grade for summer programming, the, the decisions are already made. The decisions, their course selection is, is before the summer programming. So that's why I suggest targeting, fifth, targeting sixth and seventh grade students. If they can start talking about it and they can start playing in these makerspace uh, locations with you know, hands-on approaches in the summertime, well before they think about it in eighth grade, they'll be more available to make decisions about their interests and their families will have more um, information so that they can make better decisions about choices coming into that time of selection. So, um, so I'm hoping that we can put some of that together in our summer programming as well. That's a great idea. And then I would be remiss if I did not thank Lisa Fifield at the high school because um, we certainly went to her with edits, not just once, not just twice, not just how many times, six books. We had six different books. So um, yeah, and to, to think that we have this one little typo in there. <laughs> so hopefully um, when you do make your motion, you consider um, the, the change in that one section so we can move forward. There's so much that's gonna happen once this is approved. We can start purchasing the equipment um, for Project Lead the Way. It's all exciting stuff. Thank you. Great. For the Thank chair, you. Ms. Navarrete. So this is fantastic. I did have a question about the innovation pathways. Will you, do you be able to report back to us after course selection how many students have entered and what is the entrance process? Is it simply selecting the courses? So for students that, it, so the courses are open to uh, any student. So if you're an eighth grade student, um, we've had events, we've had flyers, we've had um, events happening at the middle school, and we also have had parent evenings um, where we've showcased the entire offerings at Bartlett where we included the pathway. Um, students that want to take the first course, um, and, and I know more about health and um, healthcare and social assistance because I jumped in. Uh, manufacturing is already up and running, but it, the same process happened with that program. But any student can take the course. Um, you can either take it in ninth grade, the first course, or you can start in 10th grade. And um, you can take it just because you're interested in it, but you don't want to be in the pathway also. So there's multiple entry points. There's no prerequisites for those courses, which is kind of nice. And so we're anticipating um, we're, we're working very hard to market it. We are anticipating at least one um, Principles of Biomedical Sciences next year. We already have one or two, two uh, of the first course for manufacturing, but we do have a lot of seniors who are graduating. So next year, we're gonna have one of the second course, I believe. I wish definitely, Michelle- Definitely one, but- Definitely one. Sign up for it, but we can definitely let you know how many sign up for the pathways. Um, and there will be a process that we're in the middle of working on to kind of fine tune that too. So. Yeah, so we're working all that out. We have a lot of helpers with us with that, but we are advertising and we can certainly keep you up to date. But I do know that we definitely have plans for the number of um, students that, that we can take into each classroom and whether or not we're gonna have one classroom or two classrooms, it really depends on how many kids sign up. So a student would be able to identify themselves as an Innovation Pathways student. Is, is it a program? Yes. So we have, we have a bunch of drawings that kind of show the pathway. So students, there's so many ways to access it. So you could come into ninth grade and take biology, and you could take that first course with biology if you wanted to, or that might be too much for some. So you could do biology, and then the second year, you could de decide to go project lead the way all the way with either manufacturing or healthcare and, and social assistance. Or you could take the first course along with a different science course if you, some students might be really interested in science. So there's different ways to slice and dice. We have probably a six page document with different pathways that we've looked at for students. Um, and some students might just want to come in and do biology, chemistry, physics, or and now that we have environmental science, they might want to do biology, environmental science, chemistry, but they could take one of these courses as an elective if they're not in the Innovation Pathways program. So does that answer the question? We're getting there. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a process because we're also. And 
and for clarification, do students receive the a trade certificate at the end of the Innovations Pathway Program? That's, I didn't hear the question. Do they receive a trade certificate? I, I think you receive a trade certificate if you've done the credentialing along with the programming. Um, the goal of the, if you're following the four years of the Innovation Pathways, is to do the four courses and then do the internship. But what Mrs. Chaplin is saying, there's multiple entry points for kids. So you can take one, you can take one in each pathway to, to try out your interests. I think um, the goal is to have kids leaving here with some credentialing. Because we're new, because this is we're rolling it out one course at a time, um, we don't have all the answers, um, and we're not sure how kids are going to float in and out of this. We know that we purposely went with the Project Lead the Way curriculum because of the high level of rigor, because it was prescribed, um, and gave additional supports to the teachers because it's a different teaching approach. It's much more project-based, and they receive ongoing support through the four years. So right now, Michelle um, Bigelow and Jib Nebelon um, volunteered to be the advanced manufacturing teachers. As we proceed down the health and human service um, pathway, we are going to train two teachers for that prescribed program um, with the goals of building partnerships with businesses um, that, um, with the biomedical, um, where we can streamline kids into um, internships. Uh, and I guess just to get to your question, it really depends. What we're trying to do is open doors for kids. And it really depends on a student's individual desire and passion. So uh, you know, if you're a real science person, you could take multiple science classes and really end up with an internship that leads you to a job or leads you to a pathway in, in, in college that you would have never been able to explore at a high school level. And that's really our goal, is to open up those career and college pathways ideas for kids. And, you know, it's not realistic for us to put pressure on kids to know what they're going to do. I mean, most 30-year-olds don't know what they're going to do. Um, but we want to give kids that exploratory opportunity. And, um, you know, we'll get better at answering the specific questions, but I don't think it's as clean cut as it's what the, what the student puts into it. We're going to have the opportunities and the goal is, by the fourth year, to earn some credentialing in either pathway. And thank you. And I think what I'm hearing with what you're saying is it is open to everybody. Yes. Yeah, it, it's open to everybody. And I think what will really help a lot for us, because we're just ready to kind of rock and roll with this, is that once it's approved, then we can get real serious about you know, really seriously marketing it. It is an actual course. It's in the program of studies. Um, and so we can do so much more with it. But um, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Great discussion. Any other comments or questions from the committee? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the Bartlett High School program of studies as presented with the revisions that were indicated. So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. Lori, would you pull the committee, please? Yes. 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 The motion passes. Great work. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is corrective action plan progress. We're going to share tonight a little bit about some other work that's being done. Dr. Mackay has been working diligently with um, all of the L teachers and um, on the corrective action plan for our L program. Thank you. Um, so one of the first elements that we were found in corrective action was uh, not having an identified process, an ongoing process for monitoring student progress. And so we are happy to report that all schools have created uh, what's called language acquisition teams, and they're teams of teachers and administrators that meet and discuss whether it's trends of data, could be um, so access testing takes place, which is the student um, language proficiency test for all Ls. 
Uh, and when those results come in, that team gets together and talks about which students have reached a certain level of proficiency and they're considered former Ls and they need monitoring which students didn't make progress and need us to do a little bit more. Um, it could be on, you know, taking a look at all the Ls and iReady or Dibbles or MCAS and really taking a look at are the L students making progress across those other measures as well. Um, it could be taking a look at the number of years to proficiency. So it really helps us make decisions about our programming, whether we need to add minutes, whether we need to add staff. It's really been informative. We have added staff this year um, with your support, and it's really been informative as we, re as we receive um, a lot of students. Our numbers have increased significantly at the high school, and the majority of the students are older Ls, which presents with different needs than uh, a student starting school as an L. And so we're investigating different ways that we can support um, these newly arrived students. Um, we have continued to work on our L curriculum, which was another piece that we didn't have a bona fide L cur ELD curriculum, English language development curriculum. Um, you see that reflected in the language in the program of studies, which they're now called ELD classes, English language development classes. Um, we've utilized professional development days to ensure that teachers have time, that L teachers have time to develop the curriculum to really understand the resources and what they need to map. Uh, using resources from Rita and Desi as well. And we're engaging a consultant who is very familiar with the program that we purchased to help our teachers at the secondary level um, curriculum map. And finally, I think an area that we've made um, a lot of strides in has been a translation and interpretation. So we've created some systems They've existed for quite a while, but our use of them hasn't always been consistent across the district. And so um, we've had to um, make some changes so that we are providing consistent interpretation and translation to students. Um, there, I don't know if you're familiar with PowerSchool. PowerSchool is our data, our student system, and there are some icons that serve as alerts. So when um, a class list shows up or a student shows up, there's an alert that um, if you click on it, it pops up and it says family has requested translation and in what language. And so that is 100% across all schools. We did that um, this year. Um, we also, each school maintains a list. So there's like a four way measure to get the information out to teachers, to um, evaluation team chair, um, uh, people um, to invite L's to translate invitations. There's a, a system that we contract with for translation of documents um, and a phone translation system that we use. And so um, I would recommend that anything else that we do, we've translated handbooks. I would suggest that athletic information um, be translated for our families because I, I, I was sitting back listening and wondering how many L's participate in athletics and um, is one of the reasons that they may not is because the information isn't always provided in a language the family can understand. Um, is there um, anything else that we can do to provide uh, translation for services? Any flyers going home about academics? Any flyers going home about programming? I know that we do already do a, a lot, but um, my hope is that the persistence has uh, created an awareness and uh, a sense of like, yes, we have to remember to translate across the board. And so um, I'm, I'm happy that we've been able to be persistent with that and, and we're showing some positive gains with that. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that we will move out of corrective action if these steps continue to take place. Thank you for your updates, Dr. Mackay. Any questions or comments from the committee? The next item on the agenda is the culturally responsive classroom library. Again, that's Dr. Mackay. And before you do speak, I just want to um, compliment you as well on the hard work of organizing um, the improvements that need to be made in the L um, department. I think that it's understated. Um, by you a little bit. I think we've made great gains in the last year in terms of making sure that we had a curriculum, making sure our teachers were trained, making sure that there was 
you were revisiting and you were involved with all of these steps. So um, your hard work um, is noticed and I will pass it to you to speak about our culturally responsive libraries. Thank you. Um, as we talked quite excitedly at the last meeting or the last time that I was here, we uh, were looking at purchasing. We did purchase a, a culturally responsive library for um, all classrooms pre-K to eight. Each classroom um, uh, received a box of 50 books, 25 titles to each, and the intent uh, of this purchase is for families to be able to read with their children or to have books go home from the classroom um, that represent a wide array of cultural backgrounds and culturally responsive um, uh, themes. And so um, I was excited when they came. The whole hallway here was filled with boxes and we opened up a couple of boxes and were amazed at the wonderful titles that we are able to bring to the um, hands, put in the hands of our students and families. And so I'm really glad to report that that has gone out to both Park Ave and Webster Middle School. That's very exciting. Thank you for all the work that was done to bring these books to the students as well. Any questions or comments from the committee? No. Oh. Hearing none, the next item on the agenda is the approval of the special town meeting article for Bartlett High School renovation project. Thank you. Um, so in your packet, you should see a copy of the special town meeting um, article. You actually don't have to approve the article. It's more of a support. At the time when I put it on the agenda, I wasn't positive if the school committee needed to sponsor the article or if the Bartlett building committee needed to sponsor the article. Um, and I was told it was the building committee that sponsors, and they already did approve the special town meeting article at our last building committee. So, um, but I think it would be great if the school committee would um, vote to support the article also um, in downtown so we can get it home. Excellent. Thank you, Mrs. Thank you. Brangeley. Any questions or comments from the committee about this Warren article? Okay, well, we don't need a motion, but Lori, would you poll the committee for support of this Warren article? Yes. 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 Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the review, transfer, signing of warrants, bills, payroll, and vouchers. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. 
second. second. <laughs> There's a motion and a second. Laurie, would you pull the committee, please? Yes. 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 Meeting adjourned. Good night, everyone.